You are listening to Rocky Trail Radio. Can you also just do a clap, please? I've got to put my... I'm holding my phone with one hand. <laughs> You're going to slap you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> Full pro. Because, uh, yeah, that's all the stuff I learned with you in the, in the recording suite. When oh, we did the, yeah. Voice over for the Croc Trophy movies. That um, <laughs> you gotta, <laughs> you gotta clap. You gotta clap to get the sound that's in why, the video. Right? That's why in Hollywood, and when they make films, they have a clapperboard. You know, hmm. Cla- you know, take no, one, take two, take three, etc. I'm a mountain bike event organizer. I don't have a clapperboard. I just, there's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the fans. How are you going? How do you? Uh, um, how's the last few months been for you? The short, the short version. Before I go into more details. Well, if you're talking about uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, um, I've got to say, for me personally, not much has changed. Mm. Thankfully, I've still got a job. Uh, I'm still riding my bike. I'm still with my family. And look, not much has changed. And I really do feel for those people who are in a much more difficult situation, those who are out of work, those who have uh, uh, lost their businesses for the time being because of uh, this incredible pandemic that we're going through and i know that rocky trail entertainment is also going through some hard times as well so uh reaching out to you guys uh because you do a wonderful job of course every year but uh well the wheels aren't in motion at the moment are they (laughs) no not at all um so yeah thanks very much to be honest we're actually uh surprisingly busy because uh, between teaching classes in azerbaijan and china or virtually now and doing things like uh, working on the websites reaching out to people and coming up with new ways to engage with our, our riders at the moment we we actually have quite a quite a bit to do quite a lot on our plate so the the pictures of uh, uh puzzles people solving uh 10, piece puzzles i don't think you're gonna see me doing them anytime soon <laughs> me neither <laughs> <laughs> um just one thing are you able to uh, put your camera to put it down somewhere it's it's a little bit shaky oh is it okay if you, if you can right. okay all right. So that wasn't a take. It was. Yeah, yeah. Now we're all, so we're all good. So you're going to uh, edit this? No, no, no. This is all, all stays in there. This is podcast style. I'm not um, SBS okay. level uh, professional. Professional. All righty. <laughs> uh, let's see if I that's, can do – I'll go back a little bit. How's that? Yeah, that, that's a lot better. All right. Awesome. Um, you told me the other day that if the Tour de France goes ahead – uh, you guys will stay here, do the commentary uh, remotely. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we're hoping, of course, that it can go ahead. But I think at this stage it is, uh, yeah, hopeful, hopeful at best. But you never know how quickly things, things happen. So, yeah, what are your plans a little bit? And how does it look like for you to do it from here as opposed to being there live and talking to all the people there and all that? Well, as most people know, the uh, ASO, the race organizers, have decided to move the original date from June 27 to August 27, I think it is, Mm -hmm. late August. It's the last Saturday in August. Um, Look, personally, I'd be very surprised if the Tour de France is up and running, whatever the date this year. Um, Mm -hmm. For many reasons, France, uh, of course, has been going through hell right now. I'm not exactly sure of the figures, but uh, the cases into the 100,000, the deaths into uh, into the tens of thousands, it's, uh, they're only just slowly emerging from uh, a lockdown. Uh, look, we're, we're sure we're still four months away or less than four months away, but uh, if the tour does go ahead, I'll be personally surprised. Mm. However, miracles have happened and miracles do happen. And if it does go ahead, yes, uh, SBS won't be on location in France as we've been for the last 29 years. Uh, for the first time, we'll be doing it out of the SBS, uh, the Sydney studio which will be certainly different. I mean, of all the sporting events that I've covered, Martin, there's only one, I think, where you have to be on location. And I think it's the Tour de France for many reasons. I've said this before many times, but the Tour, sure, it's it's a bike race. It's an amazing bike race, but uh, more so it's um, it's a cultural experience. And we go over there each and every year to to translate those experiences to our viewers. To do it from a Sydney studio this year, we have no choice if it does go ahead, but it's it's plan b it's plan mm-hmm. b and look australia is not the only network sbs is not the only network that will be staying home i've been told that if the tour goes ahead all of the foreign networks 
will also be doing the same, staying at home and and broadcasting and hosting the event from their respective uh, bases in their respective countries. So, look, it's a, a unique situation we're all in. Um, I'd be interested to see what the ASO does with crowds because the tour is a crowd event. I mean, mm. when they climb up those huge mountains, it's it's unique uh, in that there's nothing quite like it in the world of sport where you've got tens of thousands of people lined 10 deep on either side of the mountain roads breathing on on the riders um <laughs> uh, you, you obviously can't do this in 2020 so it'll be interesting to see it'll be look it'll be a a new dynamic whatever happens whether it goes ahead or not mm, absolutely i've seen uh, i don't draw parallels sometimes between the crocodile trophy that we're very much involved in and big bigger races like the tour de france and i see both sides as a racer as well as a supporter, like all the support crews. So I've seen both at the Crocodile Trophy, whereas it sounds a bit weird, but as a racer, it's, it's almost easy because you have three things you need to concentrate on, which is eat, sleep, ride your bike, make sure it's happy, do a few social media posts, and that's about it. Whereas if you're on the organizational side of it and your mind is just on constantly, you've got to concentrate, okay, what comes next and all this. So... The stress levels, and I mean stress in a good way, that are on you and your entire team during a big race like the Tour is, I can only assume, absolutely immense. And there's a, a rush coming of that as well, similar to the rush that the racers have. A, do you feel the same way? And B, if you have to do it from uh, a Sydney office as opposed to the traveling circus, what's it, what do you think you're going to miss the most? Uh, look, um, I'll miss the atmosphere. Uh, I'll miss uh, everything that the tour stands for. I'll miss being in France, which is a magnificent country. I'll miss that cultural experience. Uh, look, to be in a studio, let me tell you, as a host, it's boring. It's just me, <laughs> my co-host, a couple of uh, cameras, which are robotic, by the way. They're not uh, controlled by a human being anymore. Those days are gone. It'll just be me, my co-host, uh, Dave McKenzie, I'll have somebody in my ear talking to me from the control room. You're on, Tomo, you're on. Or oh, we're going to this, we're going to that. Um, there won't be the buzz and the atmosphere of, uh, of a stage finish, which is normally the case for us at SBS. Uh, look, I'll miss it. But look, on the flip side, I know uh, that the days won't be as long as they normally are. Um, when you're on the road covering a three-week uh, marathon like the Tour, our day start at 7 a.m. and I don't hit the pillow again until 1 o'clock the next morning. We, we're lucky to have five or six hours sleep each and every day because we're traveling. Uh, when I drop off the car rental at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris after three weeks, uh, I chuck the keys at the attendant and I say, and he looks at the, the, the speedometer, the, the, the speedo, and uh, he says, Mr. Tomolaris, Monsieur Tomolaris, you have done 7,000 kilometers. It's not possible in three weeks. And I say, listen here, buddy, Monsieur uh, Pierre, uh, it is possible. I've just done it. Check out the, uh, the kilometers and, and it's done. Look, uh, I know for a fact that this time when the stage finishes, I'll be going home at two o'clock in the morning in my own bed. Uh, waking up in my own house and uh, doing it all over. So it'll be a unique experience. I'll miss it. I'll miss being on location. I've done it for 24 years, Martin. So, um, you know, uh, I've been there and done that. It mm. would have been nice to uh, experience my 25th anniversary on location. Uh, but look, uh, what do you do? Mm. As long as the viewers watching around Australia on SBS have the opportunity to watch the world's most incredible sporting event, uh, for television, then I'll be happy. And that's how it is at SBS from, from uh, the top of the tree, the managing director, right down to those who are pushing buttons in the control room. We're just happy that we've still got the rights to the tour. We're just happy that the viewers can experience what we've been experiencing for the last uh, 30 years. No, 2020 will be our 30th year uh, when the tour has appeared on SBS. It all started back in 1991. Uh, our daily highlights program. I wasn't involved back then. Uh, we were basically just taking the highlights each and every day from British television, ITV. Um, so that's when it all started. But this will be our 30th year. And as long as uh, we keep doing what we're doing, um, entertaining through the beautiful pictures from France television. And look, you've got to remember, the crowds in the last 30 years have increased tremendously. It's July here. It's winter. 
People are probably watching in front of a log fire in some cases. Some are also on their wind trainers pretending they're in the peloton <laughs> with uh, Chris Froome and, uh, and Caleb Ewan mm. and, and what have you. A lot of them are pretending they're in the peloton. They're, they've got the yellow jerseys on, thinking they're, <laughs> uh, they're uh, Cadell Evans, if you like. Um, so I get all these sort of stories from people watching the Tour de France coverage. It really has changed the psyche, the television habits of Australians in July each and every year. So I'm pretty proud of that too. Absolutely. Big thing to be proud of. I mean, so so good to watch it. And uh, when you ride your bike in July during the tour, you can see actually the rider, the, the pelotons <laughs> that are out there. People are just a little bit extra keen. Even though the temperatures are uh, zero degrees in some places around mm. Australia. Yeah, they still get out, don't they? And pretend they're, oh, yeah. Uh, Pretend they're Chris Froome or uh, or whoever, uh, Egan Bernal, the, the Colombian guy who won it in 2019. Mm. Speaking of SBS and everything that goes on there, um, talk us a little bit about the newsroom. What's going on there? What are the major changes that you guys had to go through in order to, to bring us the news in times where I'm assuming that the news uptake in SBS is with probably other uh, good news outlets is just through the roof. I mean... Mm. People yeah. are glued to the TV screens, to the phones, to the computers yeah. to get as much good content as possible in times where, yeah, every every man in his Twitter account is a journalist all of a sudden. So you got to be care very careful with what you get there. So what are the changes first that in order well, to bring the news? For those who don't know, uh, when I'm not uh, hosting cycling events, and I haven't done any this year apart from mm. uh, the national championships in Ballarat in January, uh, I work in the newsroom. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a news presenter. I backfill for um, our chief news readers. Um, I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter. I'm doing news stories as well as sports stories. Uh, and our news service uh, is daily from 6.30 p.m. every night. What makes SBS World News different to, I think, the commercial networks is that we don't necessarily focus on um, local events, specific local events. We do obviously focus on uh, national news stories. Um, but I've got to say, Martin, uh, with COVID-19, our audience numbers have really spiked. In fact, they've doubled. Uh, people are turning to SBS uh, wow. to tune in to see what's happening around the world. I mean, you might get uh, COVID-type stories on the commercial networks, but they certainly are more local. And that's that's fine. That's, uh, that's, uh, um, that's what they're catering for, their audiences. But we're caught catering for a national audience uh, that might have international interests. And... Um, Look, uh, there's a lot happening around the world, as you know, uh, in Europe, uh, the United States, of course, with so many uh, deaths over there and cases. But I'll tell you one thing, um, Donald Trump, uh, when he got elected back in 2016, um, I've got to say that uh, on SBS, the, the, the news has provided no word of a lie, at least one story related to Donald Trump good or bad, each and every night since 2016. Whether you like him or not, and I'm not being opinionated here, SBS News has uh, shown at least one story minimum every night since 2016, and well before he got elected, during the primary votes, etc., and the, and, uh, the, uh, the processes that it takes to uh, get elected. And, and, and what that proves to us is that people don't necessarily watch SBS News to... Uh, because they like Donald Trump or dislike Donald Trump, they watch SBS News because they, they're curious to see what uh, the President of the United States might be up to on that particular night. So, uh, you know, that's just another example of uh, the kind of people that tune in. Yeah, I like to get up in the morning and then uh, you turn on the news and like, oh, okay, what, what has he done now? <laughs> what has he done now? Yeah. What is he up to now? Which member of the media, which journalist, male, female, black or white, has he, uh, has he made to feel that big? <laughs> Speaking of all, all these things, how do you go back about fact checking when so many news come from from all directions and the you know the buzzword is fake news and uh, yeah you don't want to be ever put into that perspective. So I know there are sort of journalistic measures in place in order to fact check something so that you can go like well with everything we know this is reasonable this is actually happening right now. Martin, when our uh, journalists in the SBS newsroom uh, put together a script, uh, they will uh, write it, of course, and then they'll have it subbed not once, twice, but three times. And uh, after it's subbed three times... Sorry, what does subbed mean? Uh, when it's uh, checked. 
<laughs> when it's checked by uh, a producer or uh, or another journalist for facts, uh, uh, that's what subbed means. It's sub-edited, I should say. Okay. Um, um, and then it goes, it gets put together by the journalist in some cases, if they're under 30 years of age. If you're a dinosaur like me and uh, uh, modern technological uh, tools uh, are uh, beyond me, then I'll get uh, a professional editor to put the uh, story together. And when that story is cut, uh, we'll have uh, two producers on top of the ones that have read the script have a look at the final product before it goes to air. Um, and there have been many times when me and myself have been forced to make you know, little changes, minor changes, maybe a picture, a picture change or, or a word change. Um, I mean, we're not supposed to know everything. We know as much as we possibly can before we uh, put our script down and before we cut our story, before it goes to air. But there are some times, some cases where uh, we may not be um, au fait when it comes to, uh, for example, Afghanistan history or, mm. uh, or, or, or uh, Austria, for example, uh, political uh, situations, uh, historical situations in Austria. I'm just using those as a couple of examples. So, mm. look, before it goes to air, the script and the uh, final product is checked by minimum five people. And you know what? When it does go to air, uh, if it's in a political story, we'll still have people writing in, uh, bagging the reporter, bagging our news service for getting it wrong. Mm. And... Uh, <laughs> It's not wrong. It's just that it doesn't necessarily agree to the person watching on that particular night who has written into us to say, rubbish. Uh, mm. Those kind of people are very minimum. Uh, by and large, uh, the viewers that do watch our new service are very favourable. Uh, the feedback that we're getting is very positive, but you can't please everybody, can you? So we do get the occasional negative feedback, but not often. Mm. I find the same thing. You look at something and then go, okay, well, do they actually have a point? Did we make a mistake? Same with, you know, with us when I get feedback about certain events. Predominantly, it's positive, but sometimes then I think it's good because, yeah, more often than not, you can actually use the feedback and, and people have a point and go like, oh, well, actually, you know, we did make a mistake there or at least have something where we can make it a little bit better. Sometimes it's just a rant and you ignore it. That's fine, too. Um what I wanted to ask you before also was the, the changes in actual procedures. Was there much difference with social distancing going on oh, yeah. in, the, in the room? I actually saw a quite interesting, uh, speaking mm. about Austria, I saw a, a video that the journalists over there did where when, it, when, this, when it, the whole situation started, mm. they actually mm. locked themselves into a room with a team of, you know, the, the skeleton staff mm. of 10 or 20 to do the news and then weren't allowed to leave until sort of, you know, the first few weeks. What did you guys do there in terms of procedures yeah. where not everybody can come and go as they please? Look, you know, uh, when uh, COVID-19 started, I think the, the date was March the 13th when uh, the lockdowns began and uh, we were forced to change the lifestyle that we were used to prior to that date. Um, I was on leave at the time and uh, I've got, I'm a granddad. Uh, I've got one grandchild. He's two years of age. And my daughter said at the time, uh, the mother of uh, my grandchild said, Dad, you can't, you can't see River. Uh, I don't want you to go to work and, um, and uh, come home and then make contact with him. Uh, mm. We just don't know how serious this is. Uh, I was put in, in a really difficult uh, situation. I decided to go to work. I had to. I've got to make a living and work in the newsroom, and uh, I haven't uh, seen my grandchild now for over six weeks. So it's been difficult for me. As far as work is concerned, you might recall, if you're across the news, about two or three days in, we had one colleague, one staff member, who tested positive for corona coronavirus. And the newsroom was shut down instantly. Uh, we happened to produced a new service that day, but it came out of Canberra. It was only a half-hour service compared to one hour because all the journos were forced to go home, all the producers were forced to go home at one o'clock in the afternoon. So it really did put a um, – set us back big time. Um, ever since that day, I think it was around March the 20th or something, um, social distance practices have been put in place. Uh, we don't sit next to each other, obviously. We, don't, we, we sit more than two metres apart from each other. It's very difficult. Look, I was uh, told I had an option uh, to go home and work online. Um, it's difficult for someone like myself. It's possible, but it's difficult. 
you just don't have the technological skills that I don't have and I need by at times turning to people who are more skilled than I am when it comes to using a computer. Um, some people have chosen to work from home, but many of us have chosen to come to work, come to the office, come to the newsroom and produce the one hour program each and every day. It's just more convenient. Uh, we do observe the distances, but uh, things are certainly different, especially since our staff member uh, tested positive and was forced to go into a 14 day isolation period. Uh, this staff member has returned. She's in her own little uh, room by herself, just in case. <laughs> Mm. Uh, but look, it's changed. It's changed for everybody, and I'm sure it's changed for you at home. I mean, I'll ask you the question: How often do you get out now, um, and uh, and 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 spend time with members of of your friends and and, and family? Uh, we're managing this as as much as we can, and I took it quite seriously coming from Austria. So right when it all started, we actually uh, changed our flights to come back just I think five days earlier than originally planned. Mm -hmm. Just because we were afraid that Austria is going to be put on the list next and then it's going to be tricky to get into Australia. It was just this whole uncertainty. And then also arriving, we knew, okay, we've been in planes and all this. So let's just, you know, stay in isolation, even though we arrived before the mandatory isolations. Because you were away for six months, weren't you? Uh, no, not quite. Uh, just we, we left just before Christmas, so oh, which is okay. usually a time when we, when we go, yeah, something like that. When we go back to Austria, see friends and family and all that. And interestingly enough, we found out a week after we've arrived that our plane had uh, COVID positive aisles listed, including the ones we sat on. Mm. So we were quite happy that we took it so seriously and don't go out and see friends. And, uh, I'm not exactly right sure thing. what the figures are in Austria, Martin, but the figures in Italy, Spain, France, the UK, it's just horrendous. Uh, how many deaths as a result of COVID, have occurred in, in Austria. Do you know the numbers? Oh, it's not, not on top of my head. It's not nearly as bad as, as Italy because we were in Austria at the time and we saw Italy starting and, and everything from there. And mm. then uh, Austria had the luck of just being, you know, second in line almost where, it w you know, the further back you were in terms of seeing what happens in other countries, the luckier you were in a position or the better position it put you in generally. Yeah. So it was uh, interesting I mean, for Australia as well to see what happens because knowing what happens in Austria was almost like looking a week into the future in terms of what's going to happen with lockdowns and now well, with look, opening up again. Look, I've got to say uh, we've been very fortunate to have our death toll as low a a as it is. I, I checked this morning, 96 people have died and most of those were on that uh, Sea Princess ship. And yeah. uh, I, I read this morning 15 or 16 elderly people passed away from that nursing home. Mm. So, look, if it wasn't for those two um, incidents, uh, those two areas, our numbers would probably be down to about 30, which is, uh, which is very, very low compared to other countries around the world. You know? So we're very fortunate to be in this situation. Most Aussies have really followed the steps put in place by, by the federal government. So we can be pretty happy about that, I think. I, I agree, and I, I think that uh, yeah, the steps the government has taken so far, and they actually compare to other places that I see and, 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 and look at, it's, yeah, I think it's the, the right steps is, you know, nothing's ever perfect, but given how quickly we've gone to where we're at now, but uh, it's, it's been really good steps. But mm -hmm. I think the easier part was locking everything down. The harder mm -hmm. part is going to be now opening things up again in, with the right speed and of course for us as well we're looking okay well when a are we allowed to run events again what are they going to look like there's obviously a lot of planning on our side now as well to see okay well what type of events are we uh, able to offer to our our customers because in our racers because we have uh, get so much feedback from them that they absolutely miss racing and being out there mm -hmm. and being amongst the community so we want to give that back as soon as we can but also as safely as we can. So there's yeah, procedures in place that we're working on right now which are pretty much along the lines of what the government or pe people like the, the um, AIS are working on. We sort of you know, look at them for as much guidance as we can and then adapt them to make them make sense for Rocky Trail events and Rocky Trail specific events. Well, you're fortunate that most of your events, all of your events are held in Australia and I'm sure the borders will, the state borders will open up sooner rather than later. I mean, I'm hearing that uh, Australians, uh, people living in Australia, won't be able to travel overseas apart from New Zealand until early next year. I mean, uh, that's incredible to think that seven or eight months 
uh, we're stuck. Uh, we're stuck here in Australia. Think of the business world that that uh, relies on international travel. It's all going to be done like we're doing right now, mm. online, oh, Skype, absolutely. FaceTime, yeah. you name it. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, on one hand, weird. it's it's uh, it's weird. On the other hand, I think it, it creates a lot of opportunity as well. And yeah. once you get out of your your initial. Uh, shocked face where you go like, oh my God, what am I doing next? Then you got to go like, okay, well, what is likely to happen? What is the world going to look like? The world that affects me and my business and my family and how can I adapt to that? And that's event you know managers. We're, we're risk managers and, and, and that's what we do all the time. And this is no different as, as any other development, any other risk is like, okay, what is likely to happen? If th this happens, what am I going to do in order to have a good, successful event again sooner rather than later. You know, I did a story on SBS News recently about the number of people that have bought uh, wind trainers and started training <laughs> indoors uh, because of the lockdown laws. And, you know, uh, Zwift, I'm sure, and uh, those sort of uh, online, um, um, what do you call them, uh, those online uh, racing yeah, screens that you buy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Are you in Zwift yourself? Are you doing well, that? Not, have no, you tried I've, it? Just, I've just ordered an, uh, an, an indoor bike, but mm -hmm. uh, it was not arriving until June. <laughs> because they're, they're all sold out. So this was, was my next question for Rocky Trail. Um, you can race, you can ride with uh, people, friends, uh, competitively on Zwift, for example. Uh, will that be the case? Uh, is, that, is that a possible scenario for Rocky Trail one day? Um, racing online rather than, than on location, if our world changes dramatically and stays the way it is in the next 12 months or 24 months or so? Uh, yes and no. Yes, as in we actually started last week. We started uh, a Strava club, which is sort of similar. It's not quite a virtual world. You still need to go out into the real world, but you clock your, your ride and you compare these rides on Strava and another platform called Double Strength with uh, all other uh, Rocky Trail club members. So if you're using Strava, I um, uh, invite you to join the Rocky yeah. Trail Racing Club. That'd be great to have your name up there too. And then at least you can compare yourself in the real world. But, uh, which brings me to the second part, which is a no, I believe that Rocky Trail is uh, an event business that it's, the, the racing against each other is one yeah. small part of what we're doing. It's the community, it's the getting together. And I also believe that we will be able to do that in the next few months again it'll, it'll look a little bit different and then you know we're not going to hug each other and kiss each other on the finish line which is you know, <laughs> That's a shame. quite disgusting anyway after seven hours on a bike <laughs> they're not going to miss that too much yeah. but uh apart from so that no, i do believe we'll be we'll be racing again in the real world and and yeah the virtual one is not something that that we're gonna go into okay full -time. That's well, I've, I've been to many of your events, as you know, Marty. Um, hmm. Will you have you won't have those mass stars like we're we're used to seeing? Will you be forced to to uh, run an event that's basically a time trial for each of the competitors? That's what we're looking right now. As a you know, you have a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. We our take on enduro, which is the what we call the Fox Superflow, is a race format where people ride up trails neutral and then have a start and a, and, a, and a finish time on certain sections of the tracks. Mm. And their social distancing can actually be achieved quite easily. So we don't have mass starts there. Uh, things like uh, rider briefings and presentations, things like that, where everybody gets together. We're working on ways how we can disperse that and also have the same uh, experience, but without have, needing everybody to be in one spot. So we're focusing a lot on, on that because we can roll that out very quickly as soon as we're allowed to have events again. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the second one is uh, how safe is a mass start going to be? And if it's not safe, um, then, yeah, then a time trial or, or a certain window of starts is mm -hmm. going to be the option because our races are a little bit different. They're not a road race. We go mm -hmm. from A to B. Most of our races are lap races. And after the initial start while some people it's nice to see each other racing still being on the same course is already a very similar experience and mm -hmm. so i think we can do this and take away the start but not take away too much of the race feel that you get by having essentially mm -hmm. you know a mad start instead of a mm -hmm. gun start if you like well you know your first event for 2020 might be uh, held sooner than later i mean you've got sporting organizations 
talking about opening up the NRL, for example. I heard mm. this morning the AFL is looking at uh, a possible return in June, the A-League uh, in August. So, um, you know, uh, as long as the restrictions are lifted by the federal government, uh, you could be on the road or on, on a mountain bike sooner than later. Absolutely. And as you said before, there's so many people now, not only the wind trainers, but the stories we hear from bike shops, they're going through the roof. People knock on my door and ask if we can service the old bikes real quick. Because after years of being in the shed or in the garage, they bring those bikes out again. They're riding the bikes again. They see how awesome it is to get around on a bike, not just racing and riding mountain bikes, but just to roll around. How nice is it to see people explore the neighborhoods on a bike, things you and I do all the time anyway. Now there's a, a massively big audience all of a sudden you know, developing that and seeing that. And that's what I mean with opportunities. You, you have you know, all the, the, the things that are horrible that, that go on with this crisis, but then you have the flip side of seeing, well, you know, co communities open up and, and, and you know, get more connected locally by, you know, chatting with each other and, and, and asking each other where the local fun rides are that they can take their kids on. Uh, where, and this, where, is, this where, is what I really enjoy seeing. Where would you like the first event to be held? Have you got plans? Um, so we had two events. We were lucky to have already two events in, mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, which uh, um, Joe and, and Bob are two new, new staff members. Yeah. They managed those two. Um, I think the first one is probably going to be something local here because in we New South be, Wales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because one thing I think people are initially, they're probably going to be a little bit more reluctant to travel far. Yeah, yeah. So we want to, rather than ask people to go with us everywhere all over the place, we go like, okay, well, we have all those regions that we're going to come to with the events. So I think it's going to be something regional. We can um, start to start up very quickly again. So we're basically, we're ready. We're just waiting for, for the start and the goal. And so our, our, our riders, our Rocky Trail racers. So as soon cool. as, as soon as we get the goal, we'll, we'll be ready. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at the, uh, one event as well, either, either on a bike or on the mic. Both uh, are up. <laughs> <laughs> mic on the mic. Mic on the mic. <laughs> hey, before, it was awesome. Let's do it again. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, the, thank you so much for your time. Uh, pleasure, really mate. Appreciate uh, it. I should, have, I should have signed off and said, look, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Martin. How long have we known each other now? I think... Uh, we met at the Crocodile Trophy. I think the first one I was there, and I've been there 12 years. I raced it for 10 times, and I've been there twice before that. And I think I met you at the first one. I believe so. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I, went, I remember the crocodiles yeah. on my, so 10 was the first, no, it would have been eight, because I'm looking at my, I'm looking at my crocodile trophy wallet, I'm, I can, I can move this, so. Yeah, well, I remember this you telling me, you, you just got My finisher crocodile trophies on the, on the wall there. Wow. Um, so I can just look back and, and see which ones, yeah. where we're at. Yeah. So 10 you're was the first, yes, so, uh, you're, you're a fresh, fresh-faced kid then, and uh, you're still pretty <laughs> fresh-faced. Is that a five o'clock shadow? Let me put my glasses <laughs> it on. It is, it is. Yeah, me too, look, but mine's grey. <laughs> all right, I've got to chat to you, Martin. All the best. Cool. Hey, thank you, thank you so much. All the best. See you. Bye. All right. Bye now. You are listening to Rocky Trail Radio.